Hello again and happy Saturday from Metro Manila, the Philippines, Southeastern Asia. Russia pretends to be a much more democratic country than it actually is. This is, for example, because the authoritarian Russian dictator and president Vladimir Putin, who was first in office from 2000 to 2008 and has again been in office since 2012 and, according to recent constitutional amendments, or one of the many recent constitutional amendments passed by a probably rigged or at least exaggerated referendum, he has the right to remain in office until 2036 if he, well, lives that long and if he still wants to rule the huge country or he still is healthy enough to rule it. Even he did express concern that uh, he wouldn't like to be like those aged uh, and feeble uh, late Soviet leaders. And that's a good point. Um, so Russia does have at least several, possibly many, registered political parties. And there are four opposition parties in parliament. However, the ruling party United Russia has over three quarters of the seats. And even the largest opposition party, the communists, do not have even one-tenth of the seats in the state Duma, the lower house of parliament. The Federation Council, which is the upper house, is appointed by the regional authorities and officially its members are non-partisan, although of course they have their party affiliations and most of them are affiliated with the um, United Russia. At least uh, in most of the republics, the United Russia uh, holds the uh, regional headships and then clear, if not huge, parliamentary majorities. Russia is an asymmetrically federal country. It has um, these self-governing cities like uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow. It has these self-governing republics and then oblasts or administrative regions and then krais and rayons that also have varying degrees of self-government. But in practice, it functions like a centralized republic. Theoretically, it's a democratic one uh, because the executive power is under the letter of the constitution shared between the president, the, the prime minister, and the government. In practice, however, the president dominates the prime minister and the cabinet because the president has the right at any moment and for any reason to dismiss or fire the prime minister and the cabinet. The only potential democratic safeguard against the arbitrary use of these powers is the fact that whenever the president fires the prime minister or the prime minister resigns, the president must have the new prime minister candidate approved by over half of the members of the state Duma. However, if the president's party has a large majority in the state Duma, as is the case, for example, now, even this democratic safeguard is a mere formality. Uh, it was telling that uh, after the long-time Russian prime minister and then Putin's kind of substitute uh, as the Russian president, Mr. Dmitry Medvedev, was forced to resign early in 2020, his successor was appointed by a huge majority of the, or confirmed by a huge majority of the state Duma members, none voted against his confirmation, although over 40 did abstain. So let's look at some specifics now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So it largely depends on whether 
the president delegates his huge powers to the prime minister and the cabinet. Um, so it depends on that uh, basically goodwill of the president, how much real power and authority the prime minister and the cabinet have. In the 1990s, when then uh, Russian president, the late Boris Yeltsin, really tried to democratize Russia, he was often in conflict with the parliament because the parliament's lower house was then largely dominated by extremists of the left and right, communists and liberal democrats. However, since Putin took over the presidency in 2000, uh, the game has changed and the state Duma has become rather docile towards the president, the prime minister and the government. Theoretically, the state Duma can even impeach the president, although that takes a two-thirds majority and as long as Putin holds the reins of power tight, it is absolutely impossible for such a majority to emerge. But if cracks start to appear in his armor, if a growing number of even his inner circle's members start to criticize him, if the Russian economy takes a deep dive because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, for example, if there are major military and or economic and or terrorist uh, and or health crises that break out simultaneously, if there is a so-called palace revolution where Putin is quickly removed from power and either detained or even executed or exiled, then the matters would be different. Actually, once, at least once, during Yeltsin's eight and a half year presidency in the 1990s, the state Duma tried to impeach him. However, the resolution failed to get the two thirds majority required by the constitution. The state Duma technically can pass votes of no confidence against the Russian government. However, only if it passes two such votes within three months is the president forced to act, either to dismiss the government or then to call early uh, state Duma elections, depending on how uh, short time has passed since the previous federal parliamentary elections. So we can see that Russia clearly has an authoritarian, not a democratic system of government. In the 1990s, the regions of Russia were allowed to elect their own governors. However, since Putin's presidency began in 2000, this was changed. And the Russian president now appoints the regional governors. So obviously, he wants to make sure that he has effective control even over the regions and that there is a semblance of order actually he said back in 2000 that during his presidency there would be a dictatorship of laws in russia an ominous sign of what was to follow and now these 20 years later we can see what has followed dissenters have been put to death most uh, famously probably the journalist anna politkovskaya in the lobby of the apartment building where she lived in Moscow, the Russian capital, in October 2006. So it can't have been the work of an amateur. It must have been the work of a professional hitman, quite, or even very likely one hired or at least approved by President Putin, because the late journalist Politkovskaya was one of uh, his most prominent critics. And I even can remember buying and reading her chilling and profound a critical book called Inside Putin's Russia. For example, uh, he, she told the story of Misha, who was a talented student of the German language and was able to fluently translate from uh, Russian to German and vice versa. But then he started to drink alcohol. He tried to reform himself, but eventually he lost control and he died.
And while Russia has theoretically free and independent courts, in practice, uh, the president and the government dominate them. Um, while Russia has theoretically uh, a wide-ranging and vigorous mass media, in practice the state control is pervasive. And there are relatively few independent media outlets, and most of the ones that do exist, exist in the social media. And in 2019 or 2020, Russia considered establishing its own internet network, which of course prompted accusations by the pro-democracy and pro-human rights activists that Russia wants to make censoring the anti-Putin and anti-government uh, websites much easier. So, So since January 2000, 2020, the Prime Minister has been Mr. Mikhail Mishustin. And then there are these Deputy Prime Ministers, Andrei Belousov or Belousov, Viktoria Abramchenko, uh, Dmitry Grigorenko, Marat Husnulin, Alexei Overchuk, Yuri Borisov. Yuri Trutnev, Tatyana Golikova, Dmitry Chernyshenko. The Minister of Agriculture is Dmitry Patrushev. Uh, the Minister of Digital Development, Communications and Mass Media is Maksud Shadayev. The Minister of Construction, Housing and Utilities is Vladimir Yakushev. Incidentally, many of the cabinet ministers are now independents but Mr. Yakushev belongs to the ruling party, United Russia. <clears throat> the Minister of Culture is Olga Lyubomiva, or Lyubimova, sorry. The Minister of Defense is Sergei uh, Shoigu, United Russia. Minister for the Development of the Russian Far East and Arctic is Alexei Chekunov, also of the United Russia Party. The Minister of Economic Development is Maxim Reshetnikov of the United Russia Party, then two independents, Minister of Education, Sergei Kravtsov, Minister of Emergency Situations, Yevgeny Zinichev. Then Minister of Energy, Ale Alexander Novak, United Russia, Minister of Finance, Anton uh, Silvanov, also United Russia, then probably a much more famous figure in the, on the international forums than Prime Minister Mishustin, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, also of United Russia. Then Minister of Health, Mikhail Murashko, Independent, Minister of Industry and Trade, Denis Manturov, United Russia, Minister of Internal Affairs, Vladimir Kolokoltsev, Independent, Minister of Justice, Konstantin Chuichenko, United Russia, Minister of Labor and Social Protection, Anton Kotyakov, Independent, Minister of Natural Resources and Ecology, Dmitry Kobyikin, United Russia, Minister of Science and Higher Education, Vladi Valery Faikov, United Russia, Minister of Sport, Oleg Matitsin, Independent, and Minister of Transport, Vitaly Sadeliev, United Russia. Well, also in the Soviet times, in the times of the former Soviet Union, the nominal cabinet was large. At some point, I think in the 1960s or 1970s, it included over 10 deputy prime ministers. However, in the Soviet times, there was the Politburo or political bureau, the inner circle of the Soviet Communist Party's uh, influential people who functioned as the country's inner and truly influential cabinet or government and also chose the general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party who was the country's real leader. Although then the constitution was changed so that the exe that eventually the office of the president of the Soviet Union became that of the executive leader because for decades until either the 1977 or the 1989 yeah, probably the 1989 uh, 
or so constitutional reforms, uh, the office of the president of the Soviet Union was that of the highest chairperson or speaker of the Supreme Soviet, the Soviet Federal Parliament. <clears throat> Okay. While the 1991 and the 1996 and maybe even the 2000 Russian presidential elections can have been considered at least mostly free and fair, the 2004, 2008, 2012 and definitely 2018 when uh, according to the official results, Putin was re-elected with over three quarters of the, or at least over 70% of the vote, have been more or less rigged. There has been a massive media bias against the anti-Putin candidates, both in the presidential and the parliamentary elections, and probably in the regional and many of the local elections. However, in September 2019, there was a surprise because... In the Moscow City Council elections, the United Russia lost about one-third of its seats. But that was a rare exception to the usual rule, according to which the United Russia wins, or at least independents affiliated with the United Russia sometimes are allowed to win. Occasionally, opposition parties. And there is an authoritarian political culture, and clearly... Um, Russia does not meet the tests of democracy. While it is not a religious dictatorship like Iran, there is no religious test for public office, then there are a number of legal hurdles. For example, it's difficult to establish new political parties in Russia because they have to have enough signatures in a majority of Russia's administrative regions or oblasts. Uh, well, theoretically, to prevent the rise of regional splinter parties, but uh, the real reason is to prevent the rise of viable opposition parties. And then opposition politicians and activists are routinely harassed and arrested and so forth. And then Russia, just like all other dictatorships, actively censors or at least tries to censor the internet in order to block what is truly happening in the country and especially the opposition activists and groups um, information on how they have been mistreated from reaching the public. So all this proves to us that Russia is a deeply flawed country. While Russia is theoretically a democratic federation, in practice it's an authoritarian and rather centralized presidential dictatorship. There are 89 republics and other subnational jurisdictions, each of which has its own government. The Russian president has wide powers as the head of the armed forces and the Security Council, and as the practical head, the more effective head of the Russian government, federal government. So he can appoint many government officials without having to have the government's, uh, the, the appointments uh, screened by the parliament. Neither the state Duma nor the Federation Council can effectively check his powers because there are no strong opposition parties. And then the Russian courts, theoretically independent ones, are heavily influenced by the government and therefore few of their decisions can effectively challenge the government. So, and then there's a persistent asymmetric federalism. So the different federal entities or units <clears throat> have different degrees of autonomy. According to the Russian Federal Constitution, 
the federal government maintains significant authority, despite the fact that nominally also the regional and local governments have several powers. The administrative regions of Russia are oblasti or regions, minority republics, okruga or autonomous districts, kraya territories, then federal cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg and Sevastopol, and one autonomous oblast. Only republics are recognized as states by the constitution, which has been described as an asymmetry of the different constituent units. The regional government's tax revenue is not always sufficient to finance their services. For instance, in several cases, they have barely been able to pay wages and salaries to teachers and police officers. And large portions of the regional government's budgets are needed to gov cover pensions. However, Moscow and St. Petersburg do have particularly strong local governments. They both present a tax base and a government structure considerably higher than the country's other regions. Putin, for example, shortly after he took office in May 2000, created seven federal districts, Central, Northwest, Southern, Far East, Siberia, Ria, Urals, that mountain chain which runs largely in a north-south direction and is one of the conventional geographic boundaries between Asia and Europe and Volga. Already that reform reduced the powers of local and regional governments. The new federal districts began to replace the 11 traditional economic regions, especially for statistical purposes. Each district is ruled by a presidential envoy or kind of ambassador who has the power to implement federal law and to coordinate communications between the president and the regional governors. Since 2004, the Russian president has had the power to appoint the regional governors. Russia currently pre presents nine federal districts. In 2010, North Caucasus, the 8th federal district, was created from the southeastern part of the southern district. In 2004, following a controversial and probably rigged referendum, Russia annexed the Ukrainian Autonomous Republic of Crimea and established Crimea as the 9th federal district. The Crimean district includes the federal city of Sevastopol. On January the 22nd, 2020, Russia ranked 134th out of 165 countries in the Democracy Index 2019, compiled by the Economist Intelligence Unit. Russia still remains in the list of countries, or on the list of countries with authoritarian regimes, and no improvements are expected in the near future, which is tragic. Okay, so let's go to the Freedom Houses report on Russia. The score is only a few points higher than that of Iran, even though there's no religious test for a public office in Russia. So the score is only 20 points out of 100. Political rights only 5 points out of 40. Civil liberties 15 points out of 60. So the longtime Russian president Vladimir Putin firmly holds the reins of power. With loyalist security forces, a subservient judiciary, a controlled mass media environment, and a federal parliament consisting of a ruling party and pliable opposition factions, the Kremlin is able to manipulate elections and suppress genuine dissent. Rampant corruption facilitates shifting links among bureaucrats or civil servants and organized crime groups. <laughs> 
In 2019, the Kremlin-backed candidates won every gubernatorial race. However, it did suffer losses in regional elections and in Moscow. During the election campaign, as has been typical during the two decades when Putin has effectively controlled Russia politically, there was intimidation and violence against both protesters and journalists covering events. Non-governmental organizations and journalists remained under severe threat throughout 2019. Members of the sexual minorities and activists were targeted with renewed campaigns of violence and intimidation. A crackdown on the Jehovah's Witnesses, who, as a rule, uh, according to the rules established by their religious authorities, abstain from politics, including voting, abstain from saluting the flag, or at least the most conservative Jehovah's Witnesses do, and they also, uh, their young men, abstain from military service. Expanded in 2019 with worshippers uh, receiving long prison sentences under anti-extremism laws. Baptists, an evangelical Christian group, were also subject to increased government interference. So we can say generally that during most of Putin's 20 years, when he effectively has held the reins of power in Russia, most of the elections, especially at the federal level, have been rigged. In September 2019, there were uh, local and regional elections, and the Kremlin used those advantages advantages over the mass media and the uh, election of officials and so forth, and the fact that most of the elected officials are members or affiliates of the United Russia Party. Those advantages to win all the 16 governor's races, a year after four gubernatorial candidates backed by Putin's United Russia Party were unexpectedly forced into runoffs. The 2018 vote had coincided with nationwide protests over controversial pension reforms. The opposition leader or activist uh, Alexei Navalny's smart voting campaign, an initiative that helped voters identify the strongest non United Russia candidate in each race effectively concentrated opposition votes to fight against the pro Kremlin slate. However, the main beneficiaries were government sanctioned opposition parties, with some exceptions in the lower levels of government. <clears throat> in the 2016 state Duma elections, United Russia won a whopping 343 seats out of 450, securing a supermajority that allows it to change the constitution without the support of other parties. The three main Kremlin approved opposition parties, the communists, the far right liberal democrats and the just Russia took uh, 42 39 and 23 seats. According to the Electoral Commission, only 48% of the eligible Russian voters turned out to vote, the lowest figure in Russia's post-Soviet history. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the Election Monitoring Group Golos cited numerous violations, including ballot stuffing, pressure on voters, and illegal campaigning. Russia's electoral system in short, is designed to maintain the dominance of United Russia. Since 2011, only locally elected politicians have been eligible to serve in the Federation Council. And this, of course, has benefited United Russia because most local office holders are its members. Despite the fact that there are many uh, official or unofficial political parties. Uh, the system is carefully managed and therefore manipulated by the United Russia Party. It tolerates only superficial competition. So in 2018, the Justice Ministry of Russia again refused to register Mr. Navalny's 
political party. And he has been attempting to register it since 2012. And then when he was on a flight in Russia, I think, in late August 2020, he drank some tea, which was then poisoned. Uh, amazingly, Putin allowed Mr. Navalny to be flown to Germany for medical treatment, and he recovered. Russia has never experienced a democratic transfer of power between rival groups. Uh, Putin was able to become Russia's interim president at the end of December 1999, when the Sikh president Yeltsin abruptly resigned, only about half a year before his second term would have ended. And then he was confirmed as president in the March 2000 presidential elections, which probably were the last, at least, quite free and fair presidential elections of his uh, long political career. Russia's numerous security agencies work to maintain tight control over society and prevent any political challenges to the incumbent regime. The formation of parties based on ethnicity or religion is not permitted by law, and in practice many ethnic minority regions are carefully monitored and controlled by federal authorities. Women hold less than a fifth of seats in the state Duma and the Federation Council, and only a few or some of the cabinet members are women. Russia's authoritarian president dominates the political process along with powerful allies in the security service and in business. These uh, groups effectively control whatever the parliament produces and even the lower house is not freely or fairly elected. Corruption in the Russian government and business world is pervasive, and a growing lack of accountability enables bureaucrats to engage in malfeasance with impunity, much like uh, it was the case during the Soviet times. There is little transparency and accountability in the day-to-day -day workings of the Russian government. Decisions are adopted behind closed doors by a small group of individuals who do, whose identities are often unclear to the public and announced to the population after the fact. And contrary to the democracies, democratic uh, political leaders, Russian President Vladimir Putin is able to rule by giving ukazes or decrees, signing them and they have the force of law without having to be submitted uh, to the legislature for approval. Attacks, arrests, office raids and threats against journalists are common. Authorities actively targeted journalists outside Moscow throughout 2019. And then they have those trumped up charges like uh, Medusa journalist Ivan Golunov in early June 2019 was arrested for alleged drug possession. Officially, the Russian constitution guarantees freedom of religion. In practice, that has been curtailed already since 1997. The Russian Orthodox Church, without being the state church anymore, has a privileged position, working closely with the government on foreign and domestic policy priorities. The anti-terror legislation approved in 2016 grants the Russian authorities the power to repress religious groups that are considered extremist. The higher education system of Russia and the government-controlled Academy of Sciences are hampered by bureaucratic interference, state-imposed international isolation, and increasing pressure to toe the Kremlin line on po politically sensitive topics, although some academics still express dissenting views. Pervasive hyper-patriotic propaganda and political repression have had a cumulative, cumulative impact on open and free private discussion, and the chilling effect is exacerbated by growing state efforts to control expression on the internet. <laughs> 
the Russian government routinely restricts the freedom of assembly. Overwhelming police responses, the use of force, routine arrests, and harsh fines and prison sentences have discouraged unsanctioned protests, while pro-Kremlin groups are able to demonstrate freely. The Russian government continued its relentless campaign against the non-governmental organizations in 2019. Authorities impede activities in part by requiring groups that receive foreign funding and are then considered to engage in political activity to register as foreign agents. While trade union rights in Russia are legally protected, they are limited in practice. Strikes and worker protests have occurred in prominent industries, including car manufacturing, but anti-union discrimination and reprisals are common. The Russian courts lack independence from the executive branch and career advancement in, uh, as judges or among the judges is effectively tied to compliance with the Kremlin preferences. Safeguards against arbitrary arrest and other due process guarantees are regularly violated, especially for individuals who oppose are perceived as threatening the interests of the political leadership and its allies. Use of excessive force by police is widespread. Parts of Russia, especially the North Caucasus, suffer from high levels of violence. Victims include officials, Islamist insurgents, and civilians. Immigrants and ethnic minorities, especially those who appear to be from the Caucasus or Central Asia, face governmental and societal discrimination and harassment. In practice, there is lit little legal protection for the sexual minorities. Since 2013, a federal law banning the dissemination of information on non-traditional sexual relationships has been in force making public discussion on homosexuality illegal. Despite some legal guarantees of gender equality, Russian women continue to face various forms of discrimination. In July 2018, the State Duma rejected a draft law that had first been drafted in 2003 that would have expanded employment protections for women in part by setting a definition for sexual harassment as unwanted sexual attention. The Russian government places some restrictions on freedoms of movement and residence. Adults must carry internal passports while traveling and to obtain many governmental services. Power and property are intimately connected with senior officials often using their government positions to amass vast property holdings. Domestic violence receives little attention from the authorities. Legal protections against labor exploitation are poorly enforced. Migrant workers are often exposed to unsafe or exploitative working conditions. At least 21 workers reportedly died in accidents at World Cup construction sites ahead of the Soccer World Cup tournament in 2018. Both Russians facing economic hardship and migrants to Russia from other countries are vulnerable to sex and labor trafficking. And we can conclude, may God have mercy also on Russia.